Well, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. Um, this is, you know, or may not know, but this is our last uh, lecture in this uh, year's series um, of Dean's Lectures. And um, I know and I, I see a, a lot of faces here who've been here for a number of the lectures uh, throughout the year, and I want to thank you for uh, coming to these talks. Um, and you will, I think, agree with me that we've had an incredible run of uh, terrific talks throughout the year. Um, we're for, we've been fortunate to hear from the very best um, of our faculty this year and to celebrate their accomplishments, not the least of which is earning the uh, rank of professor here at the Bloomberg School of Pub Public Health. And we all know that um, being uh, appointed or promoted a professor uh, confirms not only the respect of one's peers here at the school, um, but of peers throughout the uh, country and indeed the world. So I'm, in plea I'm very pleased that we will end the year as we began it um, with hearing from one of our best and uh, foremost faculty, Dr. Janet Holbrook. Dr. Holbrook's career has focused on the design, implementation, conduct, and analysis of randomized controlled trials. And, and for the most part, multi-center uh, randomized controlled trials, I should add that. In addition to conducting, to um, contributing to the evidence uh, to inform best practices through the conduct of these randomized control trials, she is committed to advancing clinical trials, the methodology of clinical trials, and providing education on the design, uh, conduct, and interpretation of trials. Dr. Holbrook began her career at the Bloomberg School of Public Health in 1999 as an assistant scientist, then an assistant professor in epidemiology and was affiliated with the Center for Clinical Trials. She was promoted to associate professor in 2006 and to full professor in 2017. She currently works on three multi-center uh, clinical trials networks uh, aimed at, largely aimed at treatments um, for conditions related to asthma and eye diseases. Her work has resulted in over 120 peer-reviewed uh, uh, articles and book chapters. Her expertise is well recognized nationally and internationally as evidenced by uh, the multiple uh, peer review activities um, and also the numerous uh, independent data monitoring boards she is asked to serve on. I was looking at her CV and just looking at the long list of the DSMBs that she has and continues to serve on. It's very impressive. Janice's dedication to teaching is evident in multiple, multiple ways. She's the lead faculty on two courses on the science of clinical trials, delivered both here on campus as well as online, and as faculty director of the clinical trial certificate program. In addition, she offers a course on Coursera called the Design and Implementation of Clinical Trials. And to date, nearly 3,000 students have registered and completed this course. And I think it's a testament to her reach um, uh, into the community um, uh, in, her, in her teaching. Janet has advised many doctoral and master's students and has been recognized as an, as an outstanding teacher by the school on several occasions. Finally, for the past 10 years, Janet has coordinated and is a primary faculty member for an educational program on clinical trials for the FDA Commissioner's Fellows Program, a postgraduate program aimed at training scientific professionals for careers in industry and government related to pharmaceuticals. Janet received her BA in biochemistry and an MS in nutritional science, both from the University of Maryland, and she received her MPH uh, from the University of California at Berkeley, and a PhD in epidemiology from uh, the Bloomberg School. Now, I'm sure anyone who does any work in clinical trials um, uh, will very much appreciate uh, Janet's title for today's talk. I certainly do. Um, and um, I'm really looking forward to her remarks, and I'm delighted uh, to have her here with us today. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Janet Holbrook. Well, uh, thank you very much for that um, kind introduction. Um, so, and thank you for being here today. So for those of you who might not recognize where it's always something comes from, it was actually from a skit um, that Gilda Radner uh, did as one of the original cast members on Saturday Night Live. And it 
it was Roseanne, Rosanna Dana, and it was always something, if it isn't one thing, it's another. And, and that truly um, has been my experience in uh, um, multi-center clinical trials. Um, I don't have the typical roadmap for you today. Um, I want to tell you some stories that I hope um, either illustrate a principle or bring up an interesting point. But I want to give you some context for those stories. So um, as Dr. McKenzie uh, mentioned, um, I've done a lot of work in seeing and breathing. I started um, at the school um, working with Dr. Meinert um, for the studies of ocular complications of AIDS. Uh, and we did several trials of uh, treatments for an opportunistic infection that um, affected people with late stage age, but AIDS, um, CMV retinitis, uh, and it affected up to 30% of people um, at that time before heart therapy. And, the, and it was a devastating disease because it just chewed up their retina and they would suffer um, irreversible vision loss and, and blindness. And, you know, um, a, a tough thing to happen when you're also dealing with many other of the illnesses that went along with an AIDS diagnosis. Um, that is sort of naturally uh, blended into uh, working in uveitis trials. I um, worked with uh, many of the same people, um, Doug Jabs, uh, who was the chairman of SOCA, and he's also the, um, uh, I've worked with him in these uveitis trials. And uveitis is not um, as common an eye problem as, let's say, age-related macular um, degeneration or retinopathy, uh, the diabetic retinopathy. Uh, but uveitis is a significant problem because it tends to strike people in their 30s and 40s. So they have a lifetime of dealing with this chronic disease that can indeed um, rob them of their sight. And kind of um, in that development, maybe because our group was also doing some trials in asthma, I got involved in um, starting uh, the American Lung Association Airways Clinical Research Network in 1999. Uh, Dr. Samet came downstairs and said, would you guys apply for this? Um, and uh, so in that group, uh, we do trials of treatments for airway diseases. Um, our mission is to provide clinical relevant evidence that can be directly applied to clinical care. And I think not all of the trials I've been involved in, but a number of them have been um, comparative effectiveness trials. So I'm going to begin at the beginning. Um, as I told you, I started here working in um, trials of AIDS-related CMV retinitis. Um, it was, you know, so these four trials from this publication I extracted this table from, you can see they all end in RT because they're treatments for CME retinitis therapy. Um, and pretty much these trials were conducted before heart, but as heart was being introduced, um, they were multi-center. Uh, every one of them was stopped before the planned sample size was achieved, either because of a uh, safety issue, um, a survival difference in two cases, or because of a demonstration of effectiveness um, of one of the treatments, and so um, a difference in retinitis. And then another thing I'd like you to note here is the high mortality rate in, uh, in the patients enrolled in these trials. Um, it was quite sobering uh, that by the time we were like in 1992, maybe 93, and we're still analyzing data from this first trial, every one of those patients um, was deceased. Um, and and it, it really um, was sobering and quite striking. Um, so my first story is about stratification, and it is about from that first uh, trial, the Fos uh, Garnet again, cyclovir CMV, retinus, CMV retinitis trial. Um, the hypotheses of the trial, the primary hypothesis was a head-to-head -head comparison of the two drugs and, you know, with a randomization scheme of one-to-one. -one. Uh, we also had a secondary hypothesis that I'll explain a little bit more on the next slide, but it was about the timing of treatment, whether you needed immediate treatment or you could defer treatment. Um, 
The trial was stratified. We had 12 <laughs> clinical sites, um, and we also stratified it um, by the zone and extent of retinitis. Now, um, if you've taken randomized clinical trials, you know that stratification is a tool we use to ensure that we get balance in important subgroups in a population. And we always consider um, clinical site can, uh, to be a very important subgroup because care can vary a lot between these uh, different sites as well as you know, um, the population that is served by them. And if you're stratifying, you need to block. Um, so I'm not sure, but I think the block size in this trial was two or four. Um, but you'll see why that um, becomes a, uh, important in a few minutes. Um, so our planned si sample size was um, 240 patients. We had planned to follow them for two years, and the primary outcome was retinitis progression, but we were well aware of the high mortality rate, and we're also looking at death and vision loss. So this complicated schematic is sort of the randomization schematic for this trial. So um, patients were evaluated, uh, and those that were determined to have immediately sight-threatening disease, and so that was uh, disease in zone one, the center of the retina, you know, where your fovea is, um, the part of your eye that's responsible for your visual acuity, or if you had um, a, a significant amount of disease, then you went, you went into this group and were randomized to immediate therapy. For people with uh, more peripheral disease that was limited to um, the periphery of the retina and not too extensive, we came up along with um, some of the AIDS activists we worked with at the time with a treatment preference design. And you know now we call them patient representatives, then they were AIDS activists, but they truly um, did contribute to um, the design of the studies that were conducted. So the primary clinical trial question um, about deferring therapy versus immediate therapy if you had a small amount of disease um, could be answered sort of in this center um, uh, path where you were randomized either to immediate therapy or uh, deferral of therapy. And once your um, retinitis progressed, then you would be randomized to foscarnet or gancyclovir. But, and you have to recognize these were IV therapies, so there was some burden with taking this therapy. Um, and these folks were generally pretty sick, CD4 counts less than 50, so they were on other medications. And there may be good reasons for wanting to delay having to put yet one more um, medication on board. But of course, some people were concerned about their vision. So if they preferred immediate treatment, they could go into this arm of the trial and be randomized um, right away to either Fosgarnet or Gancyclovir. Or they could um, say that they preferred to uh, defer therapy, kind of watchful waiting, if you will, until they had progression. So if you look at, uh, kind of look at the red boxes, uh, we, ended up with um, about with five treatment assignment lists. Um, so sort of five strata. The, these aren't actually different um, uh, strata. But in, in essence, for that comparison of phoscarnet to gancyclovir, we had 60 treatment assignment lists across you know, the 12 clinical centers. So we had 240 patients. We got four patients in each box around the, um, uh, in each center, it would have worked perfectly. But I wouldn't be telling you about slicing and dicing if it had worked perfectly. So what indeed happened was um, we got to an enrollment of, uh, of 229 patients. Um, two thirds of them were in this immediate uh, therapy group, and, and that worked out just fine. Even though we had you know 12 lists at the clinics, um, there was enough to fill up the blocks, um, and so we came out very balanced. One third of the patients um, were in, uh, had small or peripheral disease and were able to select which treatment preference they went um, uh, into. 
So you can see most selected um, immediate treatment, some selected deferral, and a few were randomized. But um, what happened is that across 12 clinical centers, we got some pretty big departures from our um, randomization scheme. So you can see 11 versus 23 there, um, three versus 10 down here, which overall led us to an imbalance. And that imbalance is really in that um, zone two, three uh, stratum with smaller disease. Um, so you uh, might say, well, that's not really a problem. The, even though we've still randomized, we still have a va valid comparison. And um, indeed, uh, we did. We may have lost some power because we didn't have um, equal allocation. And of course, um, it might ask, call into question our randomization procedures. Anyway, as we proceeded with the trial, um, you know, the death reports were really accelerating and we were getting these in with um, by fax at the time. And it concerned us to um, uh, the number of deaths we were seeing. And so we did a, you know, an unplanned look that led to an interim analysis um, that you know, we came up with this difference that we hadn't um, really expected that indeed um, the gancyclovir patients um, were dying uh, at a higher rate. So this is kind of the reverse of a Kaplan-Meier curve. We've got the cumulative probability of mor mortality and follow-up time across the x-axis. And you can see the, the number in the risk groups is down here. So um, in a Cox proportional hazards model, that uh, relative hazard was about 1.77. And at the time, we were kind of shocked by this result. Um, we were getting drug from the two drug companies, um, from Syntex was giving us the Gancyclovir, and Astra um, was giving us uh, Foscarnet, it wasn't AstraZeneca yet. Um, and so we provided them with some interim databases so, so they could look at these results um, and uh, be able to sort of kick the tires. And as you can imagine, um, Syntex wasn't really happy with these results. Well, um, uh, as Dr. Minert helped me with uh, this talk some, and uh, one of the truisms is when it rains, you get wet. Um, so uh, Dr. Tanasha, um, who was the lead statistician on this trial, um, got this letter. It was really a letter to all of us, really. Um, from Dr. Dumond, and until uh, Steve Goodman's lecture a couple of weeks ago, I wouldn't have put Dr. Dumond's name on here, but um, now we're all about honesty and epidemiology. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the censoring pattern could indicate that the phosphorinate patients were living longer, or it could indicate that the phosphorinate patients had not been observed in the study long enough. So what um, they sent us was this graph here, and on the y-axis is the number of patients enrolled, and this is calendar time. And you can see we started enrollment in January, um, and as we went over time, that imbalance that I showed you in that other uh, diagram was building so that if there was no mortality difference and you looked at the follow-up in, um, in these two groups of people, we would have more person time in the gancyclovir group than the phoscarnate group um, because more people had been enrolled in that group. Um, so what Dr. Dumont was telling us is that um, this graph could explain this graph. That, that this mortality difference we were seeing was an artifact of the way the patients had been enrolled in the trial and that imbalance because of the slicing and dicing. Now, I think he did have a point that if the um, uh, hazard ratio of deaths had been accelerating a lot over time and it hadn't been a proportional hazards, you know, there could be some uh, problems with that analysis. Um, I had uh, quite an interesting time going through our DSMB report from October of 1991 and all of the sensitivity analysis we did to refute this, to, to um, kind of at the say no. Um, in fact, the, these are the risk sets 
and, and they have the same amount of follow-up time, and we have no evidence that the proportional hazards um, uh, assumptions are being val um, being violated. And I really think that will be a very good journal club next year to have the students go over this report. It was an amazing feat, and it was fun to go back and look at it. Um, so um, you can see that what seemed like it wasn't really a problem um, led to um, a lot of work and, and some criticism of our trial. So um, what I want to take want you to take away from this first story is the perils of stratification and blocking, and um, that you really don't want too many strata. Um, indeed, you know, we saw that um, our tried and true methods of Kaplan-Meier curves, which I believe um, were um, Dr. Meyer was here, um, are valid in the face of treatment imbalances and imbalances in follow-up time. We have risk sets that we analyze. Um, and if you have results that people don't like, expect them to attack um, the credibility of your results and of your trial and be prepared um, to defend those. Um, on a different note, you know, working with uh, these patients and the, the uh, ACT UP and these groups, um, it gave you a lot of respect um, for this patient population and for people who are willing to go into clinical trials um, at the end of their lives, basically, and trying to, to help the people that came behind them. So um, it, it helped to really um, crystallize for me some of the uh, principles of the Belmont report and about respects for persons. And the reason I bring that up is that when I went on to uveitis trials, I really worked hard to ensure that the patient honorariums um, were high, that they reflected that this patient was going to come all day and, you know, get pictures taken and blood drawn and have bone scans. And we set the honorarium at $200 per visit, which is, is quite high in clinical trials, um, even now, even though this was quite a um, while ago. Well, um, the law of unintended consequences, of course, kicked in um, that after you get $600 from an institution, you get a 1099. So for a few of our participants, it, this was quite a shock, and they were unhappy, but also um, for at least two people, it threatened their benefits on some programs like SNAP or something. And I think we, it worked out that they didn't lose their benefits, um, but you know, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, also, you know, uh, one thing I really uh, got from this experience was just um, interacting with the AIDS activists, seeing how they were changing um, the drug approval process. And so I always highly recommend this documentary that's still on Netflix, How to Survive a Plague. And it, it really um, tells the story very well. Um, and finally, you know, our by 1998, nobody had CMV retinitis anymore, or most people didn't. Um, so what, what were the lasting things that we got from all this hard work? Um, and some of it was that we, uh, there was a trained cadre of ophthalmology researchers that, that emerged from this work, and we went on to do work in uveitis and in other fields of ophthalmology. So um, I didn't really talk much about the role of the Data Safety Monitoring Committee in that last, um, uh, uh, in the FGCRT. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about it for another trial because, you know, the Data Safety Monitoring Committee is an independent group of experts that periodically comes together to review the results of your trial. You provide a big report. And they probably do the best, most detailed peer review you will ever get. Um, and so it's like every six months you get to have an oral exam. The, the good part of it is that you go in with your colleagues. You're not alone. <laughs> um, and they, they really, um, it, uh, it is a good system for, I think, getting very good um, uh, feedback on, on, on trials and, and how they're conducted. So the story I'm going to tell you about um, is the POINT trial, which is a much more recent trial. Um, and it was in patients with um, mac uveitic macular edema. So they had swelling in the middle of their uh, retina, which obviously could be sight-threatening. 
And this was a comparative effectiveness trial of three different um, approaches for steroids. One was a, a periocular um, local injection around the eye, then the intravitreal steroid right into the eyeball, and then uh, an Ozerdex pellet, which was a pellet which, of steroids, which is also injected into the eyeball, but has the advantage that you don't need as many injections. You can imagine it's not um, a lot of fun to get uh, injections right in your eye. So we had planned to um, enroll 267 participants our primary outcome was a reduction in macular edema that was measured via um, OCT. And we had three co-primary hypotheses. So let me go through those um, quickly. We had two superiority hypotheses that intravitreal triamcinolone was superior um, to periocular as well as Ozerdex, um, the pellets were superior to periocular. And we also had a non-inferiority hypothesis that this newer therapy, Ozerdex pellets, was non-inferior to the standard or, or one of the standards of care. These were both standards of care of intravitreal triamcinolone. And just briefly, I want to do a little primer on non-inferiority, um, just in case some of you are not familiar with it. Um, but the idea of non-inferiority trials is that you may want to compare a new treatment to the standard of care, and it, the new treatment may not necessarily be, be better than the standard of care, but it might be have different side effect profiles, it might be more tolerable, it might be less expensive. So in a non-inferiority trial, um, this, the, uh, we decide what's an important, meaningful difference, and we want to make sure that the difference between the two treatments, um, the new treatment and the standard that you're measuring it against, that the upper 95% confidence interval of that treatment effect is less than the non-inferiority margin, so that we can say with confidence that the, the treatment's not too much worse, you know, it, 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 if, it, if it's worse than um, the actual standard of care, it's, it's not too far off and should um, be worth the, whatever trade-offs may be involved. So back to point. Um, so as I said, we had three uh, primary hypotheses. So we took a very traditional approach and um, did a Bonferroni adjustment for that. Uh, so we took our type 1 error and divided it by 3. So for our superiority hypotheses, those two hypotheses, a p-value um, of less than 0 0.01667 would be a, what we would call a statistically significant result. And um, for the non-inferiority margin, it was the upper bound had to be less than 1 minus the alpha. And our non-inferiority margin was um, 1.16. That was a 10% difference. We're on the log scale. Um, so, and we had planned a single interim analysis at 50% of the information. It actually ended up with the logistics of planning the meeting and gathering the data. It was about 60% of the information. Um, and we were using O'Brien Fleming boundaries. And so um, the critical uh, values at the time of that interim analysis was 0 0.00132. Then, so that's what we were using for both the superiority and um, the non-inferiority hypotheses. So here are the results that we um, got at the interim analysis. Um, this top row is really just a pre-post. It's baseline versus follow-up. And it really shows you that all three treatments were effective. Um, you know, the there was a reduction in macular edema, about 23% in the periocular group, 40% in the intravitreal group, and you know, uh, close to 45% um, in the Ozerdex group. Um, so here is the 
comparison where we're testing the hypotheses. So these two are the superiority hypotheses. Um, and I just would call your attention to these p-values, and they are you know, quite a bit smaller than what we needed for our threshold for superiority. So um, by the rules of the road that we had set out, and we had established that indeed um, these two treatments were better than periocular. Um, and as far as the non-inferiority hypothesis, we had also met our statistical criteria for that at the interim analysis in that this upper bound of the 90 or of the confidence interval um, is less than 1.16. So, um, you know, this was great. This was, you know, we won, rejected all three null hypotheses. It, it was good, good news. We were happy. Um, but uh, so I tell you that story, one, to just illustrate how data monitoring can work, but also I want to focus on this particular result. So, you know, um, this particular result indicates that, you know, maybe the Ozerdex is a little better than intravitreal. Um, and, you know, and this kind of is the bounds of the difference in the treatments. So it could be, you know, similar to the difference between Ozerdex and per, um, periocular, um, but uh, you know, there's information there to be gained about how you would use Ozerdex going forward. However, journals, some have come up with new uh, guidelines. It's not, they're not published, I haven't seen them, but both the JAMA and the New England Journal um, have come up with new rules for how you publish results of non-inferiority trials. And um, I have Buzz, Light, Buzz Lightyear up here because they're going by his motto of to infinity and beyond. <laughs> so this is uh, a tables and a graph from the iCompare trial, not a trial I was involved in. Dave Shade and some others here were involved in it. So um, in essence, um, the reporting for these trials now, according to the, the journals, how they want you to report them and require you to report them, is that you have this one-sided confidence interval that indeed you're able to see that, um, you know, this treatment, whatever it is, was non-inferior. And then in the table, you can see uh, the confidence interval is from minus um, infinity to, point, uh, to 0 0.9. Um, and I, for one, haven't seen a lot of discussion of this. Um, in fact, um, now we're back to this slide, which is from the consort paper on how to report non-inferiority trials. So this is a group that promulgates um, guidelines for reporting results of clinical trials. And, uh, and indeed, JAMA still refers to this in their instructions for authors. And so the result we just saw was probably like this, um, you know, that the uh, part of the confidence interval we don't see likely crossed um, the uh, no effect. But it could have been this result. And that result, I would say, is qualitatively different than this result and something that people who want to take the results of clinical trials might want to know um, and might influence their treatment decision. And indeed, um, in non-inferiority trials, we're allowed, if we establish non-inferiority, to actually test for superiority without paying a statistical price for that. So. Um, if we establish superiority, we'll have um, treatments that are infinitely superior. So I, I think this is something that um, clinical trialists need to think about. And I wish at least uh, that in JAMA or New England Journal that they were referring to this in their instructions and, and what is their thinking about um, requiring this reporting. So um, that's my you know, kind of soapbox. So um, on to a next, another story. Um, so this quote is kind of uh, something I ran across in the internet, um, and I, it just resonated with me a lot. You know, I don't think it's the exact biblical quote from the New Testament, but you know, don't worry about tomorrow, because uh, today, uh, you know, deal with today. So I'm going to tell you about dealing with today. Um, that 
in a sister trial to the point trial is the merit trial that we're conducting right now. And we're using Ozerdex, and that's sort of the standard of care. In fact, it is the standard of care in this trial. And we're comparing it to two non-steroidal treatments for uveitic macular edema. Uh, it's important to know that the trial is being conducted in the US. Um, uh, according to this map, we have one site in the UK. We're actually bringing about uh, eight sites on now in the UK. We have one in Canada and one in Australia. Um, and we're also trying to bring on four sites in India, which should tell you that we're having problems recruiting. <laughs> Um, regardless, um, so what does this trial uh, have in common with the Boeing 737 MAX 8? Well, you all know that the MAX 8 got grounded. It was grounded in Europe and um, in China and around the world uh, for a few days before the U.S. decided to ground it. So here's the Azerdex implant. This is, shows you about the size of it compared to an aspirin. It comes in this injector. And so it gets injected um, into uh, the vitreous using the injector. Um, and in the quality assurance testing that they did on batches, they noted that there was a 300 micron silicon sphere that was coming out with the implant um, when they were doing this quality assurance testing. So this is, was unexpected and you know, unwanted. Um, so there was a recall of the Azerdex in the UK in October of this year. Um, and, uh, but we knew the batches we were using. We saw that we were using those same batches in the US because the UK clinic called us up and said, you know, what's going on? We contacted Allergan and, and they were unaware that there was a recall in Europe um, because it was in a, a number of countries. Um, and we saw that many of the Azerdex that we had used were from these affected ba um, batches, which the rate of these spheres was as high as 20%. Um, and so we had used them. Well, we didn't quite know what to do. We um, uh, certainly contacted the IRB, but what we decided to do was to stop using any of those implants from the affected um, batches, to pull them off the shelf, um, to order new supplies, and we were going to have to swallow that cost, but it seemed like the appropriate thing to do, and examine all the participants, regardless of whether they finished the trial or not, to see if they had any abnormality or we saw any of these um, silicon spheres. We actually found one in a patient. Um, it Apparently, it's like a floater that, you know, a small floater that isn't too symptomatic. She uh, notices it when she turns her head a certain way, and she actually had to, you know, they had to kind of crank her head around to even get it on an image. So um, it's not an immediate problem. There's no plan to do anything about it. Um, but we contacted the U.S., um, the FDA, uh, when we first found out about this, and they knew about the issue. And then we also submitted that um, report to the FDA. Um, and as far as I know, um, when looking at the implants, we were the only ones to report a patient which actually had this silicon sphere. But subsequently, the U.S. Um, did recall the implants, which was great because then we could um, return the ones that we had paid for. Um, but the reason I tell you that story is that because I think it illustrates that, you know, sometimes, um, and it's a standard we um, try to achieve, is that in we're giving people the best clinical care we can in these trials. You know, we really are looking out for their safety. And patients throughout the U.S. who got the Ozerdex implant who weren't in a trial didn't know about this. Um, and in fact, you know, continue to receive these implants. Now, maybe it wasn't a huge risk for their eyes, but I think it really illustrates kind of the standards that you need to have when you're conducting um, experiments in people. And, and I'm glad that, that we at least met them in that case. And so um, referring back to the quote, I'm not going to tell you this whole story, <clears throat> but of course, we're also, excuse me. In our airways group, 
we're doing a trial of um, losartan versus placebo for treatment of emphysema. So I don't know if you all have been watching, but there have been a number of losartan recalls. In fact, when I went um, to look up the actual number um, last night and you know put them on the slide, this new one popped up. It's you know been stomach turning, um, but so far our losartan hasn't been recalled. Um, I could tell you the specifics of you know they changed the manufacturing process, and so they get this. They have a side reaction that's producing this contaminant. Um, anyway, the FDA is concerned about it, but. Um, it was just uh, sort of ironic to me after we'd just gotten one, through one recall um, uh, it, uh, instance that we were soon faced with another one. So um, now I also want to go on to an, another story. Um, and this is another quote that uh, Dr. Minert often uses, you know, you can't make a silk purse from a sow's ear. Um, and, you know, what do you do with null results? Well, I, I would argue with that some, that sometimes we can make silk purses, but you know, there are plenty of things that we have done with the uh, trials other than just uh, publish the null results. And I realize that if you saw the trials I've talked to you about, you'd say, well, uh, every trial you get a, a treatment effect before it's even over. Well, believe me, that's not the, <laughs> always the experience. We have many uh, null results. But um, these are useful for all sorts of things like meta-analyses. We've done a lot of work with obesity and asthma and, and really are you know, um, doing a couple of pilot trials right now and hope to do a factorial trial in the future um, with you know, different treatments uh, for obesity and asthma. Um, and validation of questionnaires and validation of measures. There, there is a lot of things that you can do with um, these data besides uh, publish the null results, which you should do first. But um, the story I want to tell you about is uh, some two trials that we did in the Airways group. So um, this was around uh, 2003. Um, you know, reflux is common in asthmatics to have acid reflux. Um, often, at least it's been published to have be silent. So that means when you have a pH probe, they see that you have acid, you know, a, um, a low pH, but you don't have symptoms of heartburn. Um, and in fact, it's, it's not clear um, the chicken or the egg. There's some thoughts that, you know, having asthma um, kind of structurally sets you up for having reflux. And you can see that it sort of makes a lot of sense that um, micro aspirations of gastric acid could indeed induce um, uh, uh, bronchoconstriction and lead to asthma exacerbations. So um, there had been inconsistent results from a number of randomized uh, trials, you know, small ones, and um, but it was an open question. And kind of a, a, a pretty widely used practice, and although it wasn't specifically recommended in the guidelines, um, the recommendation was that if you had a person with poorly controlled asthma on pretty maximal therapy, that you um, might work them up for GERD with a pH probe, or you know, if you didn't want to give them a pH probe or they didn't want that stuck down their nose, um, you might just do a trial of um, the pH of um, a GERD medication to see if that helped. So we thought this was a great idea, and we were going to do a big trial. And we went to the uh, NHLBI with a trial um, that was big enough to test both um, adults and children, because it, it was across the board problem. Um, but if you have a big trial that's over five hundred thousand dollars, you have to get permission to um, submit it. And NHLBI was not interested in our trial. So we still thought it was an important problem. So we submitted um, a smaller uh, grant, first for a trial in adults, and then for a trial in children about three or four years later. And so these are the results of those trials. Um, so in the SARA trial, um, we had a placebo versus esomeprazole, which is Nexium. 
Um, and you can see this is events per year. An EPAC is an episode of poor asthma control. Um, and an EPAC-1 is uh, more severe or more, you know, it's like a hospitalization or um, uh, use of oral corticosteroids versus an EPAC-2, but no effect. And um, we had the same result in the uh, child in the study um, circa trial, which was the study of acid reflux in childhood asthma. Um, and in this case, we used the asthma control score. And in fact, a lower asthma control score indicates you have better asthma control. So even though it wasn't significantly different, um, it, the placebo group in this trial tended to have better um, asthma control scores. And the results across a number of secondary outcomes were also null. So I, I would argue that um, this is some evidence that PPIs are not effective for the treatment of asthma. And in fact, I'm not the only one um, that would argue that. Um, there was a uh, Editorial um, shortly after our second trial was um, published about you know the cost and perils of therapeutic creep of you know kind of using uh, these PPIs for indications that they hadn't been tested for or approved for and you know PPIs are not uh, sugar pills they come with their own risks and in fact. Um, I found uh, this article about the emerging concerns published last year, but even in our trial of children, um, we noted an increased fracture rate in the kids um, and as well as increased upper respiratory tract infections. And, um, you know, these are things that are also on the labels of PPIs. Um, so I think... Uh, that in that case, the NHLBI did us a favor because I think the two trials standing independently are stronger than one trial would have been. So um, I think these null results um, can have a, a big influence on guidelines. So um, this is the cynical side of me, you know, it is uh, what we do, does it ever really make a difference? Um, so I would just like to highlight um, two uh, trials that I, I think that I've been involved in that have made a difference, although, you know, there are others. So the, the first uveitis trial, boy, I am going quick. I'm going to slow down. <laughs> um, uh, the first uveitis trial I was involved in was a comparison of systemic therapy versus um, a flucinolone implant, a steroid implant, different than the Osrdex implant that was also um, surgically placed in the eye. Um, unclear when we started the trial how long it would last. It was thought maybe two years. Um, so we enrolled 255 people. It was about 450 eyes. And um, we, uh, you know, published our results at the end of two years. That was our um, time frame. The primary outcome was visual acuity, but also because this was the first multicenter uveitis trial uh, funded by NEI, we were able to um, uh, get funding to follow that cohort for a longer period of time. And part of that, re uh, part of the rationale for funding was that the implant was a very durable treatment. And after two years, it really wasn't clear whether it had run out or not, and whether potentially this a uh, longer term suppression of disease could actually lead to a remission that you wouldn't require further treatment. So, um, these are the publications um, after four and a half years and then after seven years of follow-up. So here are the results. Um, on the um, y-axis here is standard letters of visual acuity so that we measure on special charts, but you can see sort of how they correspond to Snellen equivalents. Um, over here up here is 2020. Um, you can see the patients had in general at the start, less than 20-20 vision, but pretty good vision. Um, and uh, after, um, oh, just let me explain. This is the um, time frame uh, uh, across from uh, follow-up at 
you know, baseline to seven years of follow-up. And these are our risk groups, you know, the people that we were able to maintain follow-up on for the entire seven years and at different points throughout the trial. So um, our first results were right here. Um, we saw no difference in visual acuity. There was some evidence that the implant was more effective in controlling uveitis activity and that the, the activity went down at a more rapid pace, that the quality of life may be, had been a little bit better in that group. Um, but as far as the clinical outcome of visual acuity, there was no difference. And one of the also surprising uh, findings that in the systemic group, people on low dose steroids actually did quite well without kind of the notorious side effects of steroids. So many of my pulmonology colleagues were um, impressed with that. Um, so anyway, we continued follow up and patients for the pretty for the most part, stayed on their assigned treatment because they were doing pretty well. Um, we had more crossovers from systemic to implant. But at four and a half years, um, it was pretty much the same story. Um, the you know activity was better controlled by the implant, but there was no real difference in um, the visual acuity outcomes. Well, by the time we got to seven years, it was a different story. Um, the implant actually uh, was um, inferior in terms of visual acuity, that um, the patients assigned uh, in the implant group had poorer visual acuity than the people in the systemic group. You know, that could be for a lot of reasons. Part of it is with the implant in their eyes, um, it didn't appear that they were being treated as aggressively for any little bit of activity. So they, because you don't kind of up the dose like you can with an oral dose, um, that they may have smoldered a little longer. The implant also, because uh, you know it was you know, surgically put in people's eyes, was associated with more local ocular side effects, um, increased incidence of uh, glaucoma. And so cumulatively over time, you know, maybe the burden of those side effects ended up um, uh, with this result. Um, nevertheless, I think it, it, it's an important um, to recognize that when you have long-term chronic diseases, the first answer, the immediate short-term answer may not um, be the important uh, and overall effect. And I'm not sure that, um, you know, maybe it's an argument for longer trials, but at least for following people up in trials. So, um, and we also got very many other um, publications from uh, this uh, study and follow-up study. Um, so I, I think it is, I, I consider it a very important contribution. The other study I wanted to highlight um, was the first study we did in the ACRC network. Um, so we looked at whether uh, flu vaccines were safe in asthmatics, at least in the short term. And um, this was a concern because as you can imagine, people with asthma, if they get uh, influenza, they're more likely to uh, have a complication of their asthma, end up in the hospital. Um, and so that increases their risk over um, the typical person. Uh, it was pretty amazing that we could enroll 2,000 people in 10 weeks. Um, so it was kind of a, a incredible trial to be involved in. And, and I'm also, you know, in this day and age, really happy to have my name on a publication that establishes the safety of a vaccine. Um, and I would also say it was an important trial for this network. You know, we got off the mark with um, a big, important trial. And so, you know, here we are 20 years later, um, still humming. But it, it was important to, to um, show that it was a productive group. Uh, we were funded by the are, are funded by the American Lung Association, and we've gone on to be able to leverage funding, leverage that funding with grants from the NHLBI and sometimes from um, uh, drug companies. But uh, I think uh, this first trial really helped set us on a course to be a su successful network.
Um, so uh, I think I still you know, have some uh, time to go here at Hopkins and in the field of clinical trials. And I think you know, I have a bright future and, and our group has a bright future. Um, although I'm a little worried about some of our upcoming studies. So I'm not gonna go into any great detail, but there are three studies we've got on the launch pad right now. Um, uh, the first is a large pragmatic trial funded by PCORI. It's called Reliance. And for it's sort of a, a secondary prophylaxis trial. So it's for people who are getting out of the hospital with a COPD exacerbation to put them on either roflimulast or erythromycin, or erythromycin to prevent um, a second hospitalization or death. Very pragmatic. We're working with the FDA and the Sentinel group to get some of our outcomes from administrative data, as well as collecting it from patients. Um, so I'm excited about that. I think it's, you know, uh, a, the most embedded uh, clinical trial that I've worked on that will really be embedded in clinical care. It has one visit where they're enrolled. Um, we also learned recently that um, the Airways uh, Clinical Research Centers um, has been funded to do a lung health cohort study. So it's not a clinical trial, so um, uh, new challenges, but it's uh, we're to assemble a group of young adults um, from age like uh, 30, 25 to 35, so at the, the time of their peak lung function, and look at predictors of you know, respiratory function decline um, over time. The first grant is for six years to assemble the cohort with the expectation per, you know, that we'll, we'll go forward. And you know, my pulmonology colleagues um, call it, you know, feel they're very excited. They're like, this is the Framingham for lungs. So I'm excited too. Um, um, and then, you know, uh, we're also launching a trial of a new therapy for uveitis versus conventional therapy. And this is a much smaller trial, but it is unique in the fact that um, because I didn't really get into it, but there's a lot of different subtypes of uveitis and they have different ways of exhibiting activity and different ways that you might measure that, whether it's on an OCT or a visual field test. So um, we're um, incorporating that into this trial. So that's what the future looks like. Um, I have a big thank you um, to some folks. Um, and I, I wanted to single out these people because um, uh, Obviously, Dr. Minert is George Washington. You know, he's my first teacher in clinical trials and a leader in clinical trials. Um, here's Elizabeth Sugar as uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson. She's at Arvo this week, but um, she's a very thoughtful person, writes things down. She's been a, a wonderful person to work with for about 13 years now. Um, a colleague I don't get a chance to work with as much, um, but worked with a lot in the past is Mark Van Netta. And he gets to be Teddy Roosevelt. Because if you go and you come to Mark with a dilemma, he's really good at discussing it. And he'll tell you the disadvantages of all the approaches that you propose. <laughs> and then the last thing he'll say to you is pick your poison. <laughs> and then um, as Lincoln, we have Bob Wise. Bob is a, a pulmonologist who is just a, a fabulous researcher, has been a wonderful mentor, and I have um, really uh, enjoy his friendship and his um, just working with him. Uh, he indeed lives up to his last name. But I, I wanted to call those people out, but it really does take a village. And I got some of the village on here, but it's huge. You know, you, you can imagine with multi-center clinical trials in the Airways Network, I think we have uh, enrolled over 6,000 patients in trials. So I've worked with a number of people and I've really enjoyed and learned from many of them. And then I, I wanted to end my talk by um, just saying that one of the people I have here that I've worked with a long time is coming back to Hopkins, and that's Doug Jabs. He's going to come back and be um, the director of the Center for Clinical Trials and Evidence Synthesis, um, I think starting August 1st, and we're really excited about that. I think um, he will bring um, a lot of good leadership skills and um uh, some good clinical trial skills and kind of the focus on translating the results of clinical trials to clinical practice. 
So um, I'm advertising his seminar. Uh, <laughs> For September 5th, it will be our first seminar, and I do believe he is also at Arvo this week. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has or any comments. So Janet, thank you so much for your presentation and uh, for your citizenship in the department. So here's my question for you. And so you raised a really important point, not about Doug. I'm not pointing at the screen, but I don't mean yeah, to be pointing at Doug. Um, Let's get these other people. About long-term follow-up of participants in trials to determine if there are events later. So either additional benefit that you can then measure later or additional harm. It's my question to you is, when there's funding, funding is usually for a time limit. Is there funding made available for long-term follow-up? And if not, what should we do? Well, um, there can be. I mean, we wrote two grants after, well, we wrote three funded grants for that must trial. Um, but you have to have, um, you know, specific aims and still be answering relevant questions. Um, I think we were at, at a somewhat of an advantage in the terms of must because of the durability of the treatment. So there was a real argument for continuing follow-up. Uh, you know, so I, I think it can be done, um, but you just have to make sure that you still have compelling questions. Well, that, that's very common in the pharmaceutical interest, industry to, to keep following people. Um, and, you know, as we, you know, get more integrated into uh, medical care and clinical care, we could probably do this follow-up for a lot less money and, and, you know, really use EMR and administrative records to continue follow-up on people um, as long as they're willing to um, accept that. Other questions? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> From George Washington. <laughs> Janet, what, what would you say about trials as to how they've changed since you started to now? What's, what's different? What's better? What's worse? Um, well, I think uh, there's a lot more rules. Uh, yeah, you know, I think that although we did really exhaustive uh, analysis in those um, CMV retinitis, retinitis trials and presented very detailed um, reports to the data monitoring committee, um, it was a little bit more the wild, wild west. Um, there wasn't as the focus on all of the uh, stopping rules and, and, and controlling type one error. I mean, we weren't totally oblivious to it, but um, it was much different. Um, I started before HIPAA, you know, so those rules have changed a lot. It seems um, a bad thing is that it's getting more bureaucratic. Um, and I, I am amazed that, you know, when you consider all of our personal information that's out there, that when we're trying to use people's information for um, evaluating treatments and we have their permission, it, it's so difficult. Now, hopefully some of the recent changes in the common rule will help a little bit with that. Um, but even, you know, in dealing with clinical sites, you know, we subcontract for all those uveitis sites. And now we have to have data transfer agreements. Why would we contract with them if we didn't want them to give us data? It seems to be, one inherent in the job. So um, I think uh, all of that is a little um, demoralizing, but um, I think the more that we can get trials into clinical care um, and, you know, possibly I think uh, the, there's a real future uh, 
for pragmatic trials and cluster randomized trials. I think those are all good things. Yes. Well, Janet, that's a great story. Learned a lot. Um, so um, I have a two question. The first question is uh, probably you have heard um, on the nationwide and the worldwide, there's a big move about a uh, big cohort. Like uh, in the US, it's all of us, in many other countries. So in, uh, also in the children, you heard about ECHO. So in the face of a large cohort, big data era, I just wonder what future clinical trial, what's the um, vision and the direction compared to those big data? Um, well, you know, ask me that in about a year, you know, after I get more into our uh, cohort study. Um, mm -hmm. I would think that the cohort trials could be a framework um, in which to nest clinical trials. But I tell you, one of the epidemiologists we're working with um, in this kind of getting this lung cohort together, their concern is, oh, we don't want to intervene, <laughs> then we'll change things. And I was like, well, you know, we can't do Tuskegee here, guys. <laughs> um, so I think, um, you know, we're going to have to uh, come to grips with some of that. But I would hope that in the context of those large cohort studies that, that there could be some nesting of randomized clinical trials and also, you know, pharmacoepidemiology and, and non-randomized comparisons. And, you know, to perhaps also get um, to look at our more uh, traditional clinical trials and be able to use data from those cohort studies to help generalize the results. May I ask this? Sure, go ahead. Another question? Um, one more question is about precision medicine. So as we have increasing capacity to genotyping people and profiling them based on multi-omics, I just wonder what's the role of the future? You talk about slicing, dicing, uh, stratify those more based on clinical or epidemiology characteristic. I just thinking down the road, what are those omics able to help dicing and slicing? Yeah, well, uh, just don't stratify by clinic, too. <laughs> or make sure you have a really big group. Uh, yeah, but no, we are seeing that come into our own work. Um, so um, I, I think you're right. It's the uh, uh, wave of the future um, to, to be trying to tailor the medicines to the you know, disease type. But um, yeah. I'm also worried about the fact that uh, it's going to take longer to enroll people in trials because you're going to have to get the result before you can enroll them. And, you know, that's always the challenge, getting people enrolled. And you don't want any delay in that. So I worry a little bit about that as well. Um, before we um, end this year's um, uh, series of Dean's Lecture, I would like to take just a minute and thank Becky Newcomer um, for all her help in organizing these um, uh, lectures across the year. And I think we're already organized for next year, right? We have a whole... Okay, well, that's a good start, right? <laughs> uh, so look forward to the, um, we'll be getting an announcement um, soon to, for you to get those um, lectures on your calendar. I think you'll all agree that it's been a, a great series of lectures um, uh, over this last year. And uh, the final lecture of the year did not disappoint. <laughs> oh, thank you. And thank you so very much, Janet. And thank you for all you do and continue to do. And the best of luck in your ongoing trials. And we look forward to hearing the results. Um, and I think we do have food for the reception. Those of you who are so those of you who weren't with us last uh, last lecture, the caterer at the last minute didn't show up, so we didn't have any food. But this uh, time we do have food and drink. So please uh, join us uh, by the Wall of Wonder to congratulate Janet and to um, uh, uh, have some time to talk to one another. Thanks. <laughs>